All right, everyone. Matthew's going to talk to us about chaos theory. We're running a little late as we uh, had a little bit of AV juggling to do. So without further ado, Matthew Brahms and, um, wow, unicorns barfing rainbows. Yes, that's what we're all about here, right? Unicorns and rainbows. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm Matthew Brahms. I work at Under Armour, a company here in town that we do have an office. Um, we saw a talk yesterday about chaos engineering as well, uh, which was great. So this is kind of a follow-on to that. Um, today's talk is about 101, more of a field guide to where do I start, what are the principles, what's the culture, what's this workflow look like, um, and discussing some of that. You can find me on Twitter. It's there if you're interested. So just a brief bit about me um, in pictures. I have a son, Maverick, there on the left-hand side who's really cute. He's about to turn two. Um, right to the right, I have another little one due in about two more weeks, a little girl. So we're excited for that in our family. A lot more chaos coming, right? Um, they keep me on my toes. My wife, Chelsea, is there. My dog, Chloe, a Scottish Terrier. I love baking and cooking vegan treats. So that's mm, so, so good, right? It's good that I work at a fitness company too, right? <laughs> Takes care of that. And in a previous life, I was a classical musician. I have degrees from Ohio State and Carnegie Mellon in music performance. So that's where I come from in a background. So fairly different than the traditional computer science degree. So here's what I hope to give you in exchange for your time in coming to the talk. Basically, we want to understand the definitions of chaos engineering, hear a brief history of the field, describe the mindset methodologies you would use to do chaos engineering, know what steps you can take to start doing chaos engineering in the wild, meaning at your company, at your house, on your laptop. There's ways to start now. Realize the valuable outcomes of having a chaos engineering group at your organization. Prepare for some common myths you're probably going to run into if you get interested in chaos engineering, because they come really fast, right? And then have some resources for further investigation of the discipline to learn, how do I learn more? How do I find out more technical things about this? So just a quick survey here. Who are we in the room? I'd like to know. How many people are developers, primarily consider themselves developers in the room? OK. How many are ops people, SRE, DevOps? I mean, OK, fair number. How many people are QA or QE? OK. Software engineers, a few of those, OK. How about management? Business people, yeah, okay, cool, cool. So hopefully in this talk, a major theme I'd like to come across would be that chaos engineering goes amongst every single person that's on that list. Everybody is a part of this. Like, it applies across the spectrum of your company, from the CEO all the way down to engineers writing code. So you may have heard of chaos engineering. It's kind of a big deal, right? Um, it's being thrown around, there's a lot of buzzwords. You're seeing things at conferences pop up now, like chaos engineering workshops. There's even a company, Gremlin, that started about chaos engineering. So it's a thing that's coming. But I'm curious, how many people today actively do chaos engineering? Anybody actively run it? OK. Anybody heard about it and like, is interested in starting to do it, maybe, potentially? OK. And how many people are like, this is brand new? Like, wow, this is like interesting, maybe. OK, a few people. Fair enough, OK. So here's a working definition we can start with. Chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. Important things to note in there would be distributed systems. So this is typically done on things that are running in a distributed fashion. If you have a monolith, you can do chaos engineering on it. But it gets easier, because it's usually in one spot, and it's a, not a moving target. It's a stationary target, right? Um, you want to build confidence. So the whole point of this is to gain confidence, gain knowledge, right? Feel good about this in your system's capability. And then there's the, the fun part, turbulent conditions. And then we qualify that with in production. It's like a lot of fun, right? So you can create turbulent conditions in your dev environment on your laptop. But we're talking about like going into production, like live running systems and like tinkering with things. That gets fun, and that ruffles a lot of people's feathers. Their spidey senses tingle when they start talking about doing that, right? Here's a more simple version. Bad things will and are going to happen to your system and is right now. No matter how well designed it is, you cannot become ignorant to it. Be aware. There's failure right now. So all of that can really just mean this. This is, this is the definition of chaos engineering, right? Things burning down. This is fine. It's OK, right? No, chaos engineering works to avoid this situation. We don't want to be the dog saying, this is fine. We want to be like, oh, yeah, we, we knew about the fire. There's no fire. It's good. Or we saw it, and we can control it, right? So let's start with a history of chaos engineering. Where did this come from? So this is a very brief history. This is not extensive in any way. 
but here are some major like milestones we have. In 2010, Chaos Monkey came out from Netflix, followed up the next year by Simeon Army, Simeon Army being open, release open source. Um, in 2012 is the Chaos Monkey release. In 2014, there's a role at Netflix now for Chaos Engineer. Um, in 2017, there's an open source project on GitHub that appeared called the Chaos Toolkit. That's something you can go and look at running. It's pretty cool. Um, in 2018, Gremlin hosted the first Chaos Conference in San Francisco last year. Really cool event. I was able to go. It was a great time of hearing a lot of people talk about this new field and saying, hey, how, do we, how does this work? How are we doing it now? And then in 2018, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation has a chaos working group that they are going to work towards maybe becoming a SIG, I believe. And they have a GitHub repo that you can go and check out and see what the meetings are, and the notes from the meetings are there. So a question, where else can we find chaos engineering like beyond like the scope of computers? So I'm a huge like naval aviation fan, so obviously I was drawn to that initially, like landing airplanes on moving boats in combat situations with explosives on them, not just people, like all kinds of things can go wrong with that, right? And when you're out in the middle of the ocean, there's not a divert field. So like, <laughs> you get on the boat or you don't, right? Um, so those are in, that's something we see chaos engineering may, may come into play at. Air traffic controls in the United States, there's a lot of studies that have been done on that, papers you can read about. Pilot procedures, like Boeing 737 MAX 800 things, it's in the news right now. Like this stuff, chaos engineering could apply to this in a very significant way. Um, electrical power systems and grids in the United States. We have public water systems this could apply to. Medical devices and hospitals, like these systems that I'm listing here are all like super critical systems that can't go down. And when we talk about our businesses and places that we work at, are they of that level of importance? Maybe, maybe not. But we would like to think that they are. So we can apply practices applied to these places where it is truly life or death in our situations. Um, highway infrastructure and car crash safety ratings. Like who wants to make sure that their car has been tested for safety before you buy it or put your child in it? Like big deal, right? So one thing that I read about recently that I was super interested in is the U.S. has built these new aircraft carriers, and they're like $14 billion or something like that, right? The Ford-class aircraft carriers. So they took the first one, and they took it out to sea, and they're exploding live ordnance very close to the ship. And you're like, wait, this doesn't make sense. This is $14 billion worth of our wealth and treasure, and we're about to go potentially like hurt it possibly. Well, I'm sure they're not going to hurt it, but they do have to simulate with an actual working carrier, not just a computer simulation, what happens if a large explosion in a combat situation were to go off? Will the engine still work? Can we escape that blast? If the blast does come, or do the watertight doors work? Will we all sink and die? These are things that people think about. So coming from that mindset of saying these are things that people do in, in real world scenarios um, outside of computer science or computering, what is a methodology or mindset that we can bring to it about chaos engineering? So first off, chaos engineering, it's a discipline. So this would imply rigor, as in like the academic sense kind of rigor. It's not something you're like, oh, this is something fun I can just look at and you know, try it. No, this is something you should really take time to study, understand, and apply like this if you're taking a college course. You'd want to read the textbook, you want to do some homework, think about it, not just show up to class and be like, ready to take the exam, let's see how this goes, right? That's a different type of chaos engineering. So each organ person is going to be unique in their impl implementation of chaos engineering, right? And it's not a process that we can say we do and then file it into the abyss of a wiki, like Confluence or something, right? And things go to just disappear. Can't do that, right? You have to constantly be thinking about it and working on it. So next step would be, or next principle would be, we want to form hypothesis. So you should know your application and tech stack very well, like from, you know, Requests coming on the internet or a user all the way down to like bytes on disk. We should know all of those different things. If there's holes in that, this is where things can kind of go wrong and that's when you get paged at two in the morning. Um, I'm on the infrastructure team so that happens sometimes, right? You don't want to be caught at two in the morning being like, oh, that's the one thing I don't know about. Oh, here we go, right? Um, then you have to page someone else and like make their life interesting at two in the morning. So part of forming a hypothesis means you might use a whiteboard to know that your entire system, maybe grab a senior engineer or someone who's been longer at the company than you have, go to a whiteboard and say, hey, I want to want to walk through generally, here's I think the three systems I get it down to. Here's a front end, here's like some middleware, and here's like a database. Then if they can go in and show you more of that and explain each of those better, that's something you'd want to do as in, in forming a hypothesis. Find a domain and service that you have or run in your stack where a failure is likely to exist and you can start there. That was a good way to form a hypothesis. Like, my front end Nginx server. We all know Nginx pretty well, hopefully. Like, let's start there. Let's see what we can do with it, about that. 
Next, you would want to have the idea of testing your idea. So now that you say, hey, I think I can bring down this by doing this, test it, right? The goal is either to validate or invalidate your failure case hypothesis. And the act of testing your hypothesis should not, big point here, result in any harm to your user experience. So you don't want to go around deleting things that are going to bring your system down that you know of right away. Analyze your results. This is like following the scientific method here, right? We want to perform an have a hypothesis, perform an experiment, and then analyze our results. So you want to capture lessons learned because those are really priceless. Things you've learned in this brief amount of time it takes to run one of these can save you a lot of downtime, right? And the results and lessons learned should be communicated to the entire team. That's super critical when you do chaos engineering. Like, you have to let people know. Otherwise, why did you do it? Why waste the time and put the effort in, right? Action items should be started as well to increase resiliency if issues were discovered. So if you find a bug, just don't be like, oh, we know there's a bug, and we know there's a workaround at 2 in the morning we could do to do that. Spend some time and invest to fix it in the process, and then it literally can be tested again, right? And prove that it's not a problem anymore. And then obviously repeat that, just like science, right? So let's talk about getting chaos engineering into the wild. How would you do it? So there's different levels I have here on slides we'll go through. Level zero is sort of the basics. And hopefully at the end of the talk, you'll just say, hey, I'm at level X. This is what I can do to get to the next level, right? So level zero is the basics. You'll need a team and engineering group in your company to get buy-in. So if you're at your company, maybe it's just yourself. Pick your home system, spin up a stack, go to GK, spin up a Kubernetes cluster in 30 seconds, start playing with it, right? You can start attacking it, right? Um, but you have to get, if you're doing this at work, get a team who's like, I'm willing to try this, right? Point number two, you're going to need full support from your engineering and business leadership, because doing this takes time. There's also some risk in starting to talk about breaking things, right? People should be aware of this, and also the company should have the intent to do the right thing. If your company doesn't have a general culture of let's do the right thing, build this in the right way up front, then that's something you should address like level 0.5 maybe, right? Um, you're also going to need observability in your application, your infrastructure, user, and your user experience. So if you can't, if you run an experiment and you say, I, I'm going to saturate this with web requests, if you can't go into a dashboard or in some way have a metric to see how many requests you're getting, that's a big problem, right? Um, that's something you need to remedy as well. So note here, if you can't detect or observe failure states when you're for not formally doing chaos engineering, then you're going to have to adopt that, right? Um, also, another thing that you need to have is a fully documented and robust SEV or outage procedure. Quick question. How many people today would say, I feel comfortable in the amount of observability I have in my application stack right now, that I know I could do this? I would feel comfortable getting past this point. Anybody have that? Okay, a few people. How many people have a SEV outage process that's codified, so if something goes wrong, the following steps occur down the chain? Like, I know this will get paged, and then this is going to escalate, and blah, blah, blah. Very few people. Okay, so that's something to talk about with your organizations, right? That's, that's huge. And those, these could be, like I put in the bottom here, those could be entire talks on their own about like, having a SEV outage process and then having observability and like, making sure your stack's monitored, right? So these are big things. Level zero is kind of a big bucket to fill, right? But you have to have maturity in this before you can move on. Level one, assemble a team. So the time that this may take will vary uh, to be in this level. So you're going to have to have two things before you can move on. A defined product, domain, and service that you've all formally with your group decided we're going to go and test this, right? And it can be fairly simple to like get this started. Maybe we're going to test like database backups. Okay, that's something that you could do maybe offline or, you know, like it's, it's something easy to test. If you're like, we're going to run an end-to-end -end test from the front to the very end and do everything, then that's going to take forever to set up, right? So be smart in how you pick this if you're starting. And you're also going to have a group of engineers and people to do this. So as you assemble this team, this is where it includes everybody, right? So you should have ops in the room, you should have dev, you should have security, product, business people, whatever that means in your company. I mean, you, the culture that Chaos Engineering brings when you really look at it is something literally, you could bring the CEO down from his office to sit with you guys and run an experiment. It should be that level of, look, we're going to break this potentially, but we want to prove that if we have a scaling event coming, like a Black Friday event or something, we can handle it. That's something that everyone's curious about because, like, money is at stake here, right? Or your company's reputation, things like that are at stake. So everyone has a vested interest in this. So the more people that you can bring into a group to get together, the better off this is going to be. Um, you need to involve and inform these people as they come into the experiment, like, hey, we may have failure, we may not. Um, those people would need to have time to attend a pregame meeting and experiment follow-up. So, hey, do these people have time to come and spend about an hour and a half or two hours with me doing a little bit of talking before, doing the experiment and following up on it? 
And also, is there appetite from the team that if we find something wrong that we need to fix, will we actually be able to put that in in a fairly quick fashion into our coming sprint or something to get that resolved? If you don't have any of that, then like this may make you stall out at level one, right? And then pro tip, be sure to set the expectations for the level and volume you need like up front, like in an email, in a documented fashion so people can commit to that, right? Um, and here's an example. We will test our resiliency at the base layer of our infrastructure compute nodes. So at level one, you should have a hypothesis. Here we go. And we have a team. So moving into that hypothesis, you get everybody together and you formulate it and you think, hey, we're going to test our base level compute. So maybe that's your test your Kubernetes nodes. Maybe that's test like VM creation or an AMI spinning up in AWS or something like that, right? You should be able to take that thing you've picked, whiteboard that entire hypothesis until everyone in your working group has a clear understanding of like how it works. That means everyone. Don't be like, well, we have herd immunity now. Like there's a few younger junior engineers in here who don't get it, but you'll figure it out as we go. Like don't do that. Like you need to make sure they're with you because the, as you learn and discover things, this is a way to level up your team. It's like an added benefit we'll get to in a second. Like leveling up your team and knowledge and building a better team. So don't exclude anybody, right? Assign your roles and responsibilities that each person will have. For instance, you could have a documentation user who's just going to write how things go and what happened when. Have a quick reaction force team standing by so if something does go wrong in your experiment, you can hit that big red button that says stop and someone can be there who's able to triage and get you know, users back to their normal experience. Be a good SRE here, right? And then have someone just to operate the experiment. Have someone just sitting there being like the pilot, being like, I'm just going to press buttons. You tell me when to press it. So then that is everything's delineated. We're starting to paint a picture here. It looks like mission control or a NASA launch, right? Everybody loves space, right? Be kind of like that. And then above all, make sure documentation is socialized to their teams about what you're about to do. Here's an example. If we delete or lose a cloud compute node, our Kubernetes cluster will recover and reprovision with no downtime or negative user experience, either internally or externally, right? Level three, have a game day. This could be one to four hours in length. It just depends on what your company or how you want to do it. Ideally, a game day looks like a launch at NASA. Each person shows up, they know what their role is, there's a script, it's ready to go. They have a pre-launch checklist, every team's like, I mean, if you really want to get into it, you can be like, go for flight, you know, be like NASA, right? I mean, you can do that, have fun, right? Um, but if there's any issues impacting the system that you know of or something might be up before you start your chaos experiment, like, don't start it. Like, don't be like, well, something might be wrong in production, but we're gonna go ahead and continue, because that could compound things, right? Blast radius is what we're talking about here, right? Um, then if you're ready, proceed with your experiment. Keep a keen eye on watching the progress as you go. So example, our infrastructure is currently not degraded anyway. It is not Black Friday. That's a good thing. We have SRE, SWE, support, security, business folks all in the room here. We're now ready to begin deleting a node and watch the success rates of our APIs while expecting and monitoring for the node recovery and reprovisioning. Cool. That happens. Then you learn lessons. They're good lessons or bad lessons. There's no really bad lesson, but like things will either break and you either back out of the experiment or it will go well and you like we learned that this is not a problem for us. Check it off your list. You've gained maturity, right? Gather those lessons, let everyone know about them. Um, so you can socialize them. Make sure if you do have follow-up items that you plan the work for engineering teams fairly quickly to get those resilience gaps closed. And then you're going to communicate the value of all that has occurred in this process to the business. This is essential too. So make sure this is a great way, it's SREs, and we just talked about like letting people know our touch points with other people in the organizations in the first talk this morning. This is a way, hey, we tested our database recovery. Send out an email to all the engineering people, all the, everyone in the company if you want, right? And say, hey, we did this, it worked for us, we know we're resilient in this fashion, therefore we won't suffer from this during a big event like Black Friday. That can build confidence in your team, the work you're doing, people will be like, that's really cool. It also gets people like, I wanna be part of this too, right? Game day templates. So just a quick shout out here to Gremlin, gremlin.com slash game day. They have templates that you can go through and get all of this on if you want to just like start getting going fairly quickly, right? Outcomes for chaos engineering. So what do we hope to gain by doing this rigorous process and investing quite, quite a bit of time and resources into this, right? So first, we want to avoid the cost of downtime, right? This is all in like the DevOps and SRE wheelhouse. This is great. So questions you can think about here. Do we really know how much downtime really costs our our enterprise in sales, engineering, loss of productivity. Who here has numbers in their company? Like an hour of downtime is this much money, and you know that. Any, okay, a very few people. Okay, that's something I recommend. Go check that out. Actually, a funny, f funny pro tip here. If you go and try to find the answer to that, you're going to meet a lot of different people in your company, <laughs> and, get, and you're going to learn a lot of cool things, and then put a number together, and I bet you 20 bucks or more that like people in leadership will be actually be really curious about that number when you get it, and that's going to spark some really interesting conversations about your chaos engineering program. User experience will go up, obviously, if you don't have downtime. Another benefit, right? 
Another benefit, decrease your pages to your SRE, ops, and dev folks. I like sleep. We all like sleep. We all like expected things. We don't like chaos, unplanned chaos, right? So this is the way we can do that, decrease that. How many people track the number of pages their teams get? Yeah? Do you guys talk about that? Hopefully you're talking about that and following up with, are we decreasing pages? Is our work, our toil getting down? And our like, proactive work going up? Things like that, right? And then the blast radius or cost of an outage event is large. Make sure that you realize that there's lurkers and there's active costs to these different parts, right? We can decrease. Increase productivity. So obviously, less time and money spent on outages and reactive work will increase our time and resources for proactive and work, work and features. We can build more features if we're not always firefighting, right? This is fairly simple math, right? What value could our ops teams add if they were distracted less? So if you were fighting fires less, what could you build? Maybe you can tell your folks, hey, we got you build a command line tool that would troubleshoot our Kubernetes environments for developers who weren't in the Kubernetes that much if we could just stop fighting the fires that the cluster is always going down. That may be beneficial, so there may, that you may get buy-in then to increase that productivity for your team by doing some chaos engineering to get out of some of that and burn down some of that toil work. Number four, increase the spread of knowledge throughout your organization. This is huge. A lot of organizations have the bus factor. If Johnny leaves the team, like 10 years of knowledge walks out with him, right? That's a bad thing. How do we combat that? Spread knowledge by learning, maturing your systems, right? Um, are you tired of running into lack of documentation and run books? You could create run books off your chaos experiments, right? Tired of people leaving with heaps of tribal knowledge? That's how you fix it. So all these things were like, amen, like let's do these things, right? Like these all sound like things that we want. Well, then you hit that brick wall, the top chaos engineering myths. This is not an exhaustive list, but we'll try to go through it. Number one, it's not my job. Oh, <laughs> I've heard that a lot when I talk to people like, why don't you do this? It's not my job, somebody else's, right? This is like right in the DevOps wheelhouse of why we found, we're founded, right? It's throw that over the wall of the ops people. They're going to go run that. That's all them, right? Like just shove it out there. We, we, we made the code. You go take care of all the burning code, right? So it is our job as a whole company, success or failure, right? So if we're talking about making the company succeed, everyone's invested in this, right? Should be a moot point. Okay, next one. Now what tool do we have to go learn and buy? Chaos engineering is not a tool necessarily, it's more of a mindset, and it's a process of learning and maturing. So you don't necessarily have to go buy something right away. Now you may choose to invest in buying something to move up and, and advance your chaos engineering maturity faster, which is very nice, but you don't have to, right? Third thing, it costs how much? This is a big myth, like I don't have to pay for time of engineers not doing feature work, I, we need more features, we don't have time to do proactive work, right? Uh, yes, we do need to do that, right? Like how much, this goes back to like how much does an outage cost, right? That's where you can combat that and say, let's have a conversation about that. Number four, we have too much work to do. We have features and bug fixes. Yeah, but like how much does that work, could, how much more work could we do if we weren't interrupted and always being distracted by outages and things blowing up, right? And having to be, and then get the context switch back to that, right? Number five, we're along the same lines. We can just deal with outages just in time, right? I've heard one guy, that I worked with be like, that's why I pay you guys to be ops people, right? Like, if there's, there's going to be problems and you go fix them, that's all you're supposed to do. And it's like, ugh, right? So talk about that, have a conversation, right? And you also get number six, our uptime target's 100%. Our SLO is 100%, right? There's no error budgets, that's not a thing. That's not a thing, right? Uh, right? No, like we should talk about that and we, you're going to have a very candid conversation about running experiments in production. That gets people a little jittery, right? Number seven, why do you think we even have an ops SRE team? Covered that one kind of already. Number eight, we don't even have like an SLO, SLI, or SLA in place. Even if we wanted to, how could we start? Well, you have to start somewhere, right? So have a conversation about these. These are myths that you'll probably hear when you start talking about this. Hopefully you, have, you will have be prepared to answer them and talk through them with your people at your work. So obviously hearing those, as an SRE, I came to this conclusion. When I hear that, I'm like, oh, I just want to, it's over, right? It's done. So don't fear, I mean, these might be other things you think, right? Like, oh, but people just need to grow up. Like, understand this, there's more at stake here than just fixing things and writing features, right? Well, that's true. Empathy is a big thing we need to have. So then I also thought, but wait, there's these things too, right? There's SRE. Like, this goes to our whole, like, what is a site reliability engineer? These people are people who are looking at customer experience primarily, right? We're talking about latency, error rate, those kind of things, right? This fits right into the wheelhouse, right? We all hear those stories about Google burning down production clusters. Like, this is right in the wheelhouse of that. 
And I think a lot of times people with chaos engineering are like, oh, that's for the Googles and the Netflixes. Well, it's not. We can do that at smaller companies too, all the way down to even just yourself in your home lab doing something, right? So let's bust those myths. So first one is chaos engineering. You just need more of it, right? Just try it. Start it. Be small. I would come back and say that it's everyone's job to care about functionality, reliability, and ultimately the profit of the company, right? Take the time to be data-driven about the whole cost argument. So if you know your outage cost, make sure you can defend it with data. Don't just be like, I think it costs us like $100,000 an hour, because people are going to be like, yeah, right. But if you go find out and say, look, if you add up all these different components, which there's a bunch of them, so it's a lot of work, but once you get that number, it can definitely help you with conversations to people to get buy-in on chaos engineering and bust those myths. There's a learning implementation curve when engineering chaos, but continuous learning and improvement are job requirements, right? Like, in this field, we should never stop learning. We should never stop trying to be better. So that's something if someone's like, I don't have time for this, it's not my job, well, don't you want to learn? If not, like, that's a different conversation to have with people, right? Do we really expect and employ a strategy of hope from the book, right? That only ops and SRA should be doing chaos engineering. So there's that famous picture, right? Worked fine in dev. It's an ops problem now. So do we really expect that just those people should care about this? Like, that's a big conversation to have, right? And that, that addresses those myths directly. We all are involved in this. Developers writing code that they are inflicting upon the world, and those who run that code are all responsible in a shared sense, right? That's where we should be living. If not, that's what a culture shift pre-level zero you need to talk about with your company, right? Being clear about chaos engineering not equaling tooling is super important. So a fun way to start with this is go take your dev environment, tell your devs maybe, up to you, you decide what your relationship's like with them. Take a dev environment, put it on something like, G in my case, we were using GKE clusters, so I put my dev GKE environment on the preemptible instances. So within 24 hours, at a random, those nodes could be killed, right? So developers, just thinking like, hey, we're using, in my case, they were saying, oh, Redis. We can just shove permanent data store things into Redis, and it'll always be there, right? No. <laughs> so we discovered when one of those hosts got recycled, Redis completely got evacuated, and a new pod came up with no data in it, right? Because Redis is a temporary data store. And there's a big kerfuffle about it, right? And it was like, oh, we just learned, like, don't put things in Redis we want to keep. Those should go to a persistent data store, right? Those kind of things are, you wouldn't really think about that necessarily per se, right? You didn't buy a tool. You didn't, like, sit down and make some giant, like, we're going to do this amazing experiment. We're going to learn all these things. No, you just started something small. Like, hey, we have a basic premise in the world of Kubernetes. Things can come up and go down. So let's test that, right? That's an easy way to start. So... What can each of us do about implementing chaos engineering? Number one, evangelize the idea and principles of chaos engineering in your organizations. This can literally be something surrounding, like, I'm going to do a lunch and learn. Like, who's interested in blowing things up in production? I bet you might get a few people to show up, right? You might get a few who are going to be like, I don't want you doing this. Like, this is a bad idea. Please stop. So, but just have a conversation, right? Number two, ensure that your systems are measurable. Make sure you can detect and monitor things that are happening in your environment. You've got to know what these things are, right? You want to know about chaos, even if it's unplanned. So if it is planned, you can detect it, right? And then secondly on that point, make sure you have a SEV process in place. So if something goes wrong, regardless of chaos or not, you should hopefully in your company be like, oh, incident happened. We have an incident commander that just came on scene. He's going to get the on-call person from ops, and then maybe it's this certain product. We're going to get that on-call person in, and that happens in a fairly timely fashion with known, this is what I do. Also, you can evaluate in the part of that process, do you have run books? Like, are you waking up on call being like, ah, uh, let's just start SSHing into pods. Uh, no, like, don't do that, right? No, like, this is what we need to do to trust this, or get this process put back in place. Number three, start with whiteboarding sessions and high-level discussions about how your applications and services are architected and how they function in your company. This is easy. Kind of goes to that lunch and learn thing. Maybe you don't even talk about chaos. Just be like, hey, think in your mind, like, maybe I'm going to try to test this service. I feel like it's just fairly resilient, we should just do a double check on it, right? We'll have a lunch and learn a whiteboard with some people and be like, this is how it actually works. Maybe you learn a few new things. And then from there, you can have a better informed experiment. And out of that conversation could come a, hey, so now that we know how this works, how would you feel about testing that? Like, you say it works this way. Like, are we okay poking at this thing? That can be a great way to get in and start. 
Also, you get that added benefit of herd immunity regarding a knowledge, so your team will actually understand that, and people will be like, oh, I never knew that. I've seen this, when I've done this several times, people who are way more senior than me are like, really, it works like that? Whoever did that, like, let's go fix that, right? There's things like just talking about it that get better, right? Culture and sharing, it's awesome, right? Part of PAMS. So, number four, pick one service or application that's well documented and very observable, not in a critical production path, to serve as your first experiment upon for chaos. So obviously, you don't be like, chaos day one, what are we gonna do here? Let's go delete the production database in RDS and see if it comes back. No, this is bad, right? This is a critical path production thing, and it makes common sense, but if you don't know the blast radius of your system, you may be like, oh, this little thing over here, it's okay to just like, maybe if it goes down for five minutes, no one really, it's gone down before, no one ever noticed, then you intentionally take it down, and all of a sudden, like, it all breaks loose, and you're like, whoops, right? That's what you don't wanna be caught in, right? You wanna have a known outcome here. And then if things go wrong in your chaos, obviously stop. If you, and number five, if you need or feel like ramping up quickly, Gremlin may be a good choice. They offer a service that you can literally install an agent on your Kubernetes cluster, on your node, on your laptop, and start killing things through a very safe way, very programmatic way. It's pretty cool, check it out. Here's some additional resources. So the slides will be posted later. Chaos Conf talks are posted, those are pretty cool. There's a great one by Adrian Cockcroft that I really liked. Great, go check them out, right? Gremlin, their website, they have great documentation, community labs, tutorials, things on how to start, things like how do you set up chaos engineering on Ubuntu, right? Um, also, Gremlin recently released, released a free edition of their software. So you can actually go and sign up for Gremlin and run basic attacks on your stuff, like literally your home lab, your laptop, like containers running on Docker on your laptop for free, no cost, just as part of the community. It's like a community free edition. It's really cool. Great to check out. There's also a chaos Slack community. So there's a link here, there may be a new one, but I think that one still works. It's basically, there's a chaos engineering Slack channel that's really active, actually. Lots of people in there, there's all kinds of job postings, you can kind of get the flavor of what's going on in the chaos world right now. Highly recommend checking it out and joining it. There's also related talks on YouTube, they're really great, I put some names there, they're kind of leaders in the field. Um, you can go and check out and look at. Um, there's a working group from the, from the CNCF that you can go and look at and see what the output they're doing. Uh, the Simeon Army, documentation and that code is online to go look at. There's the Chaos Toolkit, which is really cool. Go check that out as well. That's something you can start with as well for free. And then there's also a Chaos Lab GitHub repo if you want to check that out. Um, I used it a couple months ago. It may need a few touch-ups on the Ansible tweaks, but you can actually run that Ansible code. It'll bring up a Kubernetes cluster for you and bootstrap it and put a little like shop store on there that you can actually go and attack with the Gremlin free thing like right away. So within like a maybe 30 minutes, you could get up and going with a small Chaos Lab. But you can deploy on, I do it on Raspberry Pis. So anybody can do it, right, on any of the hardware. Then some additional reading. So if you really are like, this is actually pretty cool, I'd like to scientifically or more like, you know, rigorously dive into learning about this, here's some books that I've looked at that were really helpful for me and I can recommend. So there's like Release It by Michael Nygaard, Drift Into Failure by Sidney Decker, Chaos Engineering is a little short book, it's a great one to pick up. I think it's free at a lot of conferences, you can just find it floating around at a vendor booth somewhere. But the guys from Netflix wrote that. Um, and then there's The Safety Anarchist by Sidney Decker, which is pretty good, too. Those are all on Amazon, by the way. They're fairly affordable. So, this is a brief journey of chaos engineering, like a field guide. I hope that it made sense. I hope that it was made sense and was good, I guess. Um, if you have any questions, comments, or discussions, or ideas, we do have a meetup in Austin, believe it or not, for chaos engineering. It's met less frequency in this past year, um, but last year we were fairly active. We're looking to do another one probably pretty soon. So if you'd like, you can go to meetup.com at that link and join us. We'll post announcements when it does happen. Um, but we would like to break things, and we really would just like to have a conversation about like, what we all are doing. Whether you're doing it or not, don't feel ashamed. We want people to show up and talk about how do we mature systems and have rigor around performing experiments on them and making them better. So thank you for your time. <laughs>